Hello. This is the sixth lesson in the second feta, and it's the last lesson um, in the curriculum about doubt. So where the first feta was about all the identification that we do with thought, this feta is about all the identification that we do with feelings and emotions. And if you have watched all the other lessons in this feta, then you know that it has been deep. <laughs> it's been been really hard. There's probably been a lot of things where you have uh, where I've said something that has activated a lot of thoughts, that has activated a lot of uh, feelings and emotions, a lot of doubt. Um, maybe you have been able to be in that space where you're just observing um, and and hear all the things and all of it is coming up to the surface and you're starting to to place the different emotions and the different types of identification that you have. Um, and this lesson, um, I'm going to talk about the emotional indicators, so it's the same thing. There's going to be a lot of things which you potentially can identify with. And it's not why I'm telling you all this. I'm telling you all this so you can put, put yourself in the gap. Remember when we talked about the gap um, in the first fetter? So in the first three fetters, when we talk about the gap, that is where you have the ego on one side. That is all the contracting energy. That is fear, anger, guilt, and shame. It's um, blaming, shame, and complaining. All of that. All of that that is um, looking at itself as, as me and them out there. And it's all about gaining and it's all about <clears throat> making your way in the world and all of that look back in into the lesson where I talk about the difference between the two and where, where I talk about the gap. Um, the other part of it that is, you know, on the other side, is just the opposite. And both are selfing. So the opposite is just where you have more focus on the others and where you have more focus on um, on us and you have more focus on on calm. It's a very expanding energy and it's very it's it's the opposite. Of the, of the ego basically so both are still selfing obviously and very logically being in the authentic is more pleasant because you are you are in the world in a different way you are in the world in a way where where other people are allowed to be who they are and and you are allowed to be who you are but there's still identification happening so um, in the first three fetters what we are working with is navigating through either being in the ego, the contracting, or in the authentic, the expanding, and then getting into the middle of that. Because there is a middle, there's a middle part where you are only observing, where you're not um, in any way um, affected by it. You can observe what is happening, and any situation is useful. Any situation is as it is, and any situation does not need to have anything added or subtracted because it is as it is. Uh, whenever we feel that something can be improved or be better or, um, or shouldn't be like it is, then we're in either of those two. We are in the selfing. We are where we put ourselves in the middle. My opinion counts, and I know what I prefer, and I know what I would like, and I know what... There is something beyond that, and it's not beyond like that. <laughs> it's, it's just there's something else. There's, there's, there's that space where there's no identification, where there's no preference, and there's no expectation, and there's nothing that is better or worse. It just is. And if you have a lot of pain in your body, or if you have a lot of guilt and shame, or if you are, have, are fearful about something that is going to happen, or if you, you know, explode then at any point it's possible for you first to go into the opposite finding calm by going into the opposite connect with your body breathe 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 just be here go into the opposite when you're ready and you are in the expanding and you are calm then you can go into the middle way the part into the gap into where you're pulling yourself out of the situation. And I'm not talking about nihilism. Nihilism is in the ego um, because it's contracting. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being an anthropologist where you pull yourself out of the situation and you only observe. You only observe. And what you observe is you. You observe your assumptions. You observe your preferences. You observe the, your thoughts. Um, you observe the feelings that are coming up. And just be curious to everything. No matter, you, no matter what you feel, since none of it is real anyway, and it's just thought provoked and thought created, it can be anything, you know? So, so there's nothing dangerous about it. It's just about you observing what is actually happening. Um, observing that delusion that you're in and be curious to your experience. So well, that's really odd. When you say it like that, I get this feeling of anger in me. How can that be? How can that be? Oh, you remind me of my dad. Or, oh, I was bullied at school. Huh. Okay, so right now in me, my entire identification is about what happened like 40 years ago. You know, it's not about now. It's never about now. Whenever you identify, it's never about now. When you are putting yourself in a position where you only observe, then you are completely free to experience what you experience. There's nothing that should be any different. It's also why I keep saying that nothing needs to happen. Nothing needs to change. Everything is as it is. It's only when you identify with something that you need things to be different. Or you have a preference about something being in a certain way. That's just an opinion. Just an opinion. It's just a thought. And as we had in the first Veta, thoughts are just, you know, like any other sensory experience. You don't need to ruminate about a sound or smell or a taste. You don't need to ruminate about a thought either. So what we're going to talk about today, hopefully you have been through the first feta and you're no longer identifying with thought. Hopefully you have been through all the other lessons, the other five lessons in this feta, and you're no longer identifying with feelings and emotions. If you're not completely there yet, then it's fine. You can listen to this lesson today, um, even when you're still identifying, but just be aware that you need to constantly put yourself pull yourself out of the situation because I'm going to talk about fear, anger, guilt and shame, what I call the emotional indicators. And I call them the, emo the emotional indicators because they are an indication to you identifying. So when you have any sensation of fear, anger, guilt and shame, you're not present in the now. You're not in the gap. You're not in reality. You're not in the pure being. You're not where you actually um, are living your life. You are in the story. And it's, it's a story where, where something happened and you needed to do something. And now you think you need to do that again. It's just a fairy tale. It's just a story. Um, it could be a novel. Um, so whenever you have any sensation of fear, anger, guilt and shame, um, be aware that right now you are identifying. And you need to get back to the first three fetters because identification is happening within you. Um, when you identify uh, via other people that they should have done, that's fourth and fifth fetter, but it takes you back in the lower five fetters anyway. Um, so yeah, I call it emotional indicators because it's an indication to you that you are identifying and that you need to be aware of where your mind is right now. Yeah. So this is the lesson and this is the feta where you look at who is telling you that you need to be different. Who is telling you that someone else needs to be different? Who's who's saying that? Where does that voice come from? Um and you you can there are so many amazing exercises. Um, where you can look into where where that comes from, um, the you know seeing behind the eyes. <laughs> there are so many exercises where you can look into who is actually saying that. Where is that voice coming from, and why do you believe that to be true when you hardly can uh, distinguish where the voice is coming from? Um, so why all this identification? Why is it so important to talk about? All this identification. Why do I spend? <laughs> why do we spend three fetters talking about identification, internal identification? Why do we do that? 
Well, it's because you believe it to be true. You believe it to be true. As long as you still have reactions, somebody says something, you get angry. Or somebody says that you have to do something and you get fearful. Or some you do something and you feel guilty or you feel shameful. As long as that, as that is still happening, then you believe it to be true. And that is identification. When you no longer believe it to be true, there's no longer any identification. And that puts you in the position where you are free. That there's no hook into past. There's no hook into you having to be different or, or being someone else or looking different or anything. You're just in that pure being. So as long as you have identification, there's something to talk about. As long as you believe that your past did happen and your trauma is real, then there's something to look at. And you cannot get past the fifth fetter if you haven't looked at this. It's why you hear a lot of people are stuck in the fourth and the fifth and they don't get any further. And as soon as they start to look into the sixth fetter, maybe you heard the, the interview I did with Ted, where he talked about that he couldn't get further because what is happening in the sixth fetter is that you look at everything that is out there and you take it in as if it's in here. And then you dissolve the out there and the in here because there is no out there in here. But if you have a profound sensation that the out there is unsafe, then you're not doing the exercise. You're not taking it. You can't take anything in because you, st you still believe that there's a me here that's wounded. There's a s that out there that is dangerous. I need to be careful for this in here. That means you can't get any further than the sex. So it is important to talk about. It is important to talk about. Um, the other thing that a lot of people do is um, just to, you know, bypass it. <laughs> just, you know, don't look at it. There is no me. There is no trauma. There is no nothing. I'm fine. Um, and that's a lie. That's gaslighting. And it's so, so cruel because you still react when somebody is going to your cart in the supermarket taking your cucumber. Or uh, Janice is saying something in the office. You still react. If you still, you know wake up during the night, you know, bathe in sweat about something that is going to happen, you still react. You're just lying, you know, and lying doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's just lying. Gaslighting is just gaslighting. So as long as you still believe your past to be true, your trauma to be real, um, you being unworthy, you being a gender, you being a survivor or you being a color or ethnicity or religion, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Jew. As long as you still believe in that, there's identification taking place. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. I know that for a lot of people um, in the non-binary or in the transgender community, um, I know how much trauma is there. And you need to look at it. I'm not saying that you should just go like, well, there is no me, so there is no gender. It's not important at all. It is. It is. It is important. Every single trauma we have, we need to own. And you need to own it. And you need to have a period where you um, are very, very clear on who you are and what your gender is. You need that period. Because otherwise you don't own it. Otherwise you're just, you know, bypassing the entire traumatic experience that your life has been up until now. So it is important. It is important. You need to own it. But you can use the material here and the material from the last lesson about the toxic starting point. You can use that to kind of like tease out what is actually yours and what is theirs. I'm also going to give you some exercises uh, in this lesson that is helping you placing um, the, the shame where it is, uh, the guilt where it is, the fear where it is, and the anger where it is. Uh, it's not yours. It's not yours. So when I say that, that look at who is telling who 
they need to be different. I mean, who is telling you that you're shameful? Who is telling you that you're fearful or full of anger or full of guilt? Who is telling who that? If you know that there's that there is no I and there is no one to identify with, then who is who is doing that? Who is telling that? And what I want you to do is to place yourself in a position of observation where you you only observe what is happening. Um, so you create a space where you can observe and that's all you have to do. So you observe and see what it is you're identifying with. You have no opinion about it. It's just what you're identifying with. It shouldn't be any different. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a thought. Why do you, I, you know, think that that tree is green and that sky is blue? It's just a thought. It's not real. It doesn't make the tree green or make the sky blue. It's just a thought. And the same is it with, with you. When you start to observe you, that you put yourself in that space where you only observe. You have no opinion about anything. You just observe what is there and are curious to what is there. And you need to do that because it's holding you back in your direct experience. There is a, there is a, a very, very clear sensation in your body if you close your eyes right now. So you close your eyes and you have a very, very clear sensation of being in the body and having a body. If you focus on that, in that, do you feel that nothing needs to change? If you have any thought about something that needs to be different, do you see it's a thought? This is where you're at, where it just is. Nothing needs to happen and nothing needs to be any different. Nothing needs to be added or subtracted. But everything that is right now is as it is. And that's the point. That's the point. If you cannot put yourself in a space where things are allowed to be as they are, um, then you are identifying. And what you're identifying with is shaping everything. Um, if you can't release the past and you can't release the stories, um, which means that if you, if you cannot stop talking about what a horrendous childhood you had or what people did you wrong or how you were um, bullied or what horrible things you experienced it's fine to talk about I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk about it on the contrary a lot of us need to talk about it but you talk you have a friend or your partner or a therapist that you talk with and you say it and that's it if you need to repeat it over and over and over and over there's identification happening and that identification is holding you back so if you uh, very, very depressed, very, very depressed, let's say right now. You need to pull yourself in to finding out how much of that is actual depression and how much is identif uh, identification with depression. How much of that pain is you identifying as a person that is depressive? In the Buddhist um, uh, stories, it's a, it's a story about the second arrow. That, you know, there's one thing is the first arrow that is hitting the body that is depression. The second arrow is the thoughts about it. It's the, oh my God, what I'm going to do with work. Oh my God, it needs to end. Oh my God, I can't get the treatment until Wednesday. Oh my God, I can't. All that is the second arrow. It's what I, when I talk about the second arrow, it's what I call, I am not, I should be. That is everything that we add to a thing that is in a certain way. And instead of just looking at what is in a certain way, we add to it. And that adding makes everything worse. All the posters about that makes everything worse. So if you cannot release your story, if you need to keep repeating that you're a survivor or you are, you know, you were a victim, 
if you need to keep repeating about your parents being alcoholics or you being a druggie or whatever, then there's identification happening. And that is holding you back. But just saying that, well, then I just don't talk about it anymore. Again, you're bypassing. You need to look into why you talk about it. You need to look into why, because everything we do, we do with a purpose. And if you keep talking about your depression, let's say, or you keep talking about your violent childhood, then that is giving you something. And I know you don't want to hear this. You are having, you're, you're harvesting something by that story. You're, you're getting something out of it. And if you give that up, you won't have that supply anymore. We're back in talking about the passive aggressive bully. Um, I can recommend you to look into, into the lesson from there. So whenever we say something and we expect to get something out of it, like, like you tell a story of, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so sad today. I really haven't got any energy. I really, really don't feel well. And your friend goes, it's fine. You were happy yesterday. If you go like, you can't treat me like that. You should, you should be empathetic. You're gaslighting. It, that's not right. Then instead of pointing fingers <laughs> at the friend, look at why it's so important for you. What is it in this moment right now that, it, it, that you think is missing? You think that someone else needs to do better for you. You have a story and you want everybody to react in a certain way to that story. That is identification. If you have a story and people don't react in a certain way, and that's fine. Then you are where you can put yourself in the observing role. Okay, why did I repeat that story? Why did you do that? So there's no judgment about you not doing it or that you should have done things differently. It's just curiosity to why did you do like you did? Why are you telling this story again? Why do you have an opinion about that person? Why is that? Just be curious. Just be curious. So if you cannot release all your past stories and never ever ever tell them again, then there's more work to be done. If you cannot say, my parents were amazing, and not have in you a thought about, well, they weren't, or have that bypassing with what they did what they could, but really, really, truly mean they were amazing. They were amazing people. And truly you know, empathize with their experiences, no matter what they did, no matter what they taught you to do that you then did, you know, release all that, release all that. It's just stories. It's just stories. And if you can't release your stories, then there's more work to be done. If you can't get fired or dumped or your house burns down or and terminal illness or lose a loved one if none of that can happen without you internalizing it then you're identifying and I'm, again I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it I'm not judging you in any way I'm just telling you that right now you're identifying and there is a space beyond that there's a space beyond that there's a space where nothing needs to change where you getting fired or dumped or losing a loved one or your house burning down, where well, that is okay. It's okay. And I'm again, I'm not talking about bypassing either. Do you see? I'm trying to, to keep you in the middle. I'm trying to keep you in the middle, not to be in either one of them. If you struggle with this, you know, and you jump over the gap all the time, go back to watching that, uh, that recording, that lesson, where I talk about it. It is important for what we're talking about today. So you need to at least be in a space where you are aware that the identification is happening and you can observe the identification that is happening. Um, so you put yourself in the middle and you can see that, okay, intrinsically there is nothing wrong with being dumped or losing a loved one or being fired. There's nothing wrong. Um, when I think things should be in a certain way, it's just a thought. Things clearly do not need to be in a different way because they are as they are. Yeah. And all identifications you do, they have a root. 
in fear and and shame. You might now sit and think about your parents that, but they were horrendous. I was beaten regularly. They were horrendous parents, okay? When you're in the middle, when you're in the gap, and you're not judging, and you're not, you know, saying that they were bypassing in any way, and but you're in the gap where, where you're only, only observing, then you can also see that there's no fault. You know, it's a fault-free environment. Fault doesn't exist. Fault is a thought. And you can you can look at your parents and you can place them there. You can be them with them there. Because right now your parents are not next to you, I assume. Which means that the thought that you have about your childhood and them being bullies towards you is happening in your thought. Stay in the gap. Stay in the gap. Can you look at them fault free? You know, where they did as they did. It's not right or wrong. It's just an action. And anything where you say that that's right or wrong is a judgment. Can you stay there? Can you stay in that fault free area? So it's fault free accountability. You are accountable for the sensations you create in, your, in yourself right now. They were account. You're not condoning. You're not condoning the actions. You're not going. Yeah, beating children is great. It's not what I'm saying either. They are fully accountable for their actions, and you are fully accountable for your actions. But there's no fault. There's no guilt or shame. There's nothing that needs to be any different. It just is. It just is. So staying in that space that is fault free. Um, and where you're fully accountable. You can also stay with that um, sensation that is there. You can stay with the feeling that is coming up or the emotion that is coming up. And you can just be in its presence. And that is what we need. And um, I had a, uh, I have a Danish group. And there was one uh, of the participants who talked about we had talked about this as well uh, in, in the group. Um, and she talked about her son. He was being bullied um, because he didn't change his clothes. He didn't. He doesn't like to change his clothes. Like many children don't like to change their clothes. But he had been bullied about it. And he was really, really sad. Um, and she said, my participant, she said that that previously she would have told him, well, if you you know, blame the victim. If you change your, your clothes, then they're not going to bully you. Or she could have, you know, done the opposite and, and gone like, um, you know, call the parents and, and all of that and start all that. Um, and instead she remembered about what we talked about, on about staying in that space where there's no fear and guilt and shame, where, where you just are. And she created space for him where she just listened to all the shame he had. He was so, so shameful for how, for what they had said. And, and he was so shameful for how he looked and his clothes and, and, you know, that it wasn't the same clothes as the others were wearing. And, and he was so, so shameful about it. And she was just creating space. I understand. I completely understand. I really understand. Just creating space, just listening to him. And suddenly he, he was fine. He, he had been sitting and talking, you know, wiped his nose and was like, fine, that was it. And there hasn't been a, an issue about it. He hasn't talked about being bullied. Um, he hasn't talked about any of that being an issue. And he went from being a very, very sad, introverted boy into being <laughs> extroverted and happy, happy to be in school. And she literally did not do anything. She was just there. She was just there. And that is what is about, about the emotional indicators. You don't need to do anything. You just need to be in a space where you don't judge it, where you're just present and aware with it. If you've seen the interview that I have with Ted, uh, he's talking about that he's creating space for little Teddy in him. And it's that um, allowing 
allowing whatever feeling comes up to be there and just moving with that flow. So if you have a feeling of shame, you create space for it. You don't want the shame to disappear. You're not gaslighting anything. You're just creating space for the shame. Right now, I feel a lot of shame. Okay, breathe with it. Breathe with it. If I look into that feeling that I have right now, where does that belong? Where, where, when, when did I realize that or experience that the first time? Maybe you remember. Maybe it's like, I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. If you remember, then you go in into that period and you go into that sensation you stay in that experience and the way that you was not that you were not met in that incident you meet that part of you now and all you do is just stay with it don't point fingers at the others don't find fault don't place any guilt don't have any opinion just just stay with it just stay with it if you can't remember where this belongs then just stay with the feeling that you have now. Right now, I have an immense feeling of, let's say, fear. Okay, how does that actually feel? Being in the body right now, how does it feel to be fearful? I feel my stomach, I feel my hands, my thoughts are in circle. Okay, out of the thoughts, don't identify with the thoughts, just out of the thoughts, into the sensation that you have. How does it actually feel? to be in your body right now and just stay with that and stay with that and stay with that. I'm not saying that that is going to, and then you're just poof, not fearful anymore because that you have a full life. I mean, you have a full life, but for every single time you create space to what actually is and not adding more to it with your thought, but just what actually is present in you right now, just creating space for that, the more space you are giving, which means that when a situation arrives that makes you fearful, you don't have to go into that full, you know, deadlock <laughs> of, of absolute fear. You can allow yourself just to be there with the sensation or with the feeling that is happening. So it's very much about expanding in to that world where no one are, are doing anything wrong. They're just people. And expanding into that world where fear and guilt and shame is okay. It's okay. Nothing needs to change and nothing needs to happen. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to have depression. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be uh, full of guilt. It's okay. Nothing needs to change. Just sit with it. Just, just stay with it. So just make it yours. Expand on it. Observe it. It doesn't need to change or to disappear. And if you really sit with it, you might, sometimes, you're able to hear that it's connected with an old survival mechanism. You know, it has a message to you that it's not about fear and giggle and shame. It's something else. And what you're experiencing in this situation right now is, you know, activating that memory. There's a story there that you need to look at. And it's just like peeling an onion. I mean, <laughs> there keeps being more. There keeps being more. But it's getting less potent and it's getting less powerful in you. And if you, when you have a feeling of fear and guilt and shame, if you just stay with it and then go from there from being in the observer role where you observe what is happening if you go into your direct experience and that is closing your eyes feeling into your body could this be about something else you might have a, a, a knot in your stomach and normally you think that is about fear in your direct experience right now, if you go into that sensation that you have in your body right now, could it be us be about something else? Could could there be something underlying which you haven't been aware of? When you start to tease that sensation out, is there something else underneath? I talked a lot about it when I talk about pain, 
that pain is never ever static. Pain is ever changing. Everything is ever changing. Always. Nothing is ever the same. And the, the same thing is it with pain. That pain is never ever static. So when you have a pain and you just stay with the sensory experience of a pain and you don't go into the mind where you think about the pain and how long it's going to last and what does it mean or all of that, but you just stay with it, just stay with it, then you will feel that there's like, there's like a wave in the sensation of pain. That's how the nervous, the nerves work. You know, the receptors and the, and the message has been given through the, the synapses. That's how the nerves work. You feel that wave and you can really feel into that wave and you can feel how, how the pain is shifting and moving about, moving around. Nothing is ever static. And it's the same with a sensation that you have in the body that is connected with the thought of fear, anger, guilt and shame. It's the same with that. Shame is never the same. If you keep it at shame, then it is because that's the thought. But if you go into your direct experience of how it feels to be in a body right now that is full of shame, then you will notice that first of all, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as shame. There is no such thing as fear, anger, guilt. There is no such thing. It's only a thought. If you separate the thought from the sensation in your direct experience of how it is to be in the body right now, you will feel that what you put a label on and call shame is when you remove the label, it's just a sensory experience. It might be something happening in your tummy, might be something happening in your legs, it might be happen something happening anywhere else in your body. But it is there is no such thing as a feeling of shame. That's just a label. Um, and when you really stay in that observing role, you are anything but bypassing. Anything but bypassing. Bypassing is when you're completely not experiencing it at all. What we're doing is we're diving into it and we are putting full awareness on what is happening. And then we're desiccating. Then we're pulling it apart. Um, Todd and I have talked about making uh, different meditations and different videos that is helping you with desiccating exactly what we're talking about now with that when you have a sensation or, or when you have a feeling of fear and guilt and shame how can you stay in that space stay in that um yeah gap in that space where where you create a full awareness about fear and guilt and shame and you just stay with it then you pull into a direct experience remove the label of fear, anger, guilt and shame and just stay with your direct experience of your sensation in your body. Um, for sure we're going to make meditations about that so you can work with it. So the identification is fake. We've talked about that, you know that. Identification with thought is fake. Identification with feeling and emotion, it's fake. Identification is fake. But in order for you to really, really work with non-identifying and really really be able to pull yourself into that space where you just are where nothing needs to happen nothing needs to change there's no addition there's no subtraction it just is for you to be there we need to pretend that the trauma is real because we need to put ourselves into the emotion and the feeling of fear anger, guilt and shame and when you put yourself into that uh, feeling and emotion of fear, anger, guilt and shame, that is where you have the opportunity to dissolve it. And then you can see that it's all just fake. But until that happens, we need to pretend that the past happened, that the past is even possible, that the future is even possible, um, that trauma is real. Um, everything that you identify with, we need to pretend that it's real in order for you to own it and let go of it. So I would recommend you to listen to all the six lessons uh, here in doubt and have an openness and really, really use them for pattern recognition. 
So you don't identify with what I'm saying, but you look into the pattern recognition and you can start to see the pattern that you're using for identification because identification is always about diversion. There's something that you are avoiding. That is why you're identifying. If you say something to me and I get so, so angry, something is happening in me that I don't want to look at. So I'm projecting onto you, anger onto you, so we can talk about you. It's only a diversion. And that is why we identify. If you, when you no longer identify, there's no longer any reaction. And that's also why it's so important to um, look into that delusion of the bubble of reality. Because it puts you in that space where you know that everything you think you hear and everything you um, you think you mean, <laughs> everything you perceive, you are you are aware of that it can only be a reflection of you. You can never ever have any thought or any experience that you haven't experienced previously because everything is a copy paste. And whatever you think other people are saying about you, it's not what they are saying. It's what you think you hear they say. So again, if you have issues about that and you have a lot of projections happening there, then go back to the lesson about the bubble of reality where I'm talking about this. Everything you call reality is just a copy-paste fantasy and a copy-paste from the past. You can only look at what you have already experienced or what you think you have already experienced and that is what you're copy-pasting and that is what you're seeing. And that's why it's so important to look into the fear, anger, guilt and shame for you to really, really become aware of it's not in the ego, it's not in the authentic, it's right in the middle and there you can observe what is happening. You can look at the feeling, detach the feeling, going into the sensory experience and then it's dissolved. Then it's dissolved. When you do that though, you also need to be aware that the ego is not interested in this. The ego is interested in this being um, either in a bypassing thing, that there's no me, there's no need to look at all this, there's no need to dive into all this or not do it now, you can do it at a later point or they were really, really cruel, so so you shouldn't let go of that. Then you're condoning their actions. The ego will play you lots and lots of tricks. Yeah. And when that happens, just stay with that. Just stay with that. Just breathe into it. Just be with it. It's fine. It's completely fine. So the last thing I want to say before we start on the, on the material, it is that Beware of identification with what I'm saying. Um, I'm telling you these things for you to be able to dissolve, not to identify any further. Um, remember that every single thought is identification. So me sitting and talking like this will activate identification in you. That's also why it's super helpful for you to watch the lessons over and over and over because you will hear different things every time you hear them because you have moved. I received such a lovely message from one um, that had heard um, where had heard the lesson where I talk about that every expectation is tied into victimhood, and they didn't have that. They were like, "How how is that even possible? That's not possible." But then it came out as a bite size, like two months later, <laughs> three months later, and all of a sudden it was like, oh my goodness, every single expectation is victimhood. So listen to the lessons over and over again. Listen to the bite size where I have like individual small topics that I talk about from these lessons, because you will hear it in a different way. But just remember, every thought is identifying because every thought is about something. Okay. Let's talk about fear, anger, guilt, and shame. First of all, I would like to say that both fear, anger, guilt, and shame, all of them, they have a healthy component. And that is the healthy fear, the healthy anger, the healthy guilt, and the healthy shame. And I would like to talk about that first, because that is what we need as a child when we're about three, um, and we start to create our persona, it's between three and seven, where we have that sensation of worthiness uh, that's coming in there. That's when we start to realize that there is a me here and there is a you there. That's why you can, <laughs> can have children sitting in the sandbox. Um, if they're younger, like if they're one or two uh, years old, if one child starts to cry, everybody starts to cry 
because they can't differentiate between my sensation and your sensation. I feel sad because you cry. I am sad. Um, when they when when we turn three, that is when we you know start to realize that there's a me here and there's a you there. I can hit you in the head with a shovel, and in the sandbox, and you start to cry, and I don't cry. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see if we can explore that, and that's where we. That's where we start to have, you know, those um, the terrible, terrible threes and terrible twos, uh, where the children are starting to explore the boundaries. Is because they they are now realizing that there is someone here and there's someone there. The part of the brain is starting to do that, um, and that is when we need to be taught the healthy boundaries. We need to be taught about a healthy sense of self. We need to be taught about self care. Uh, we need to be taught about self-worth, self-love. Um, and that is also where where we um, create a, we create a being in the world where we're safe. And if that is you, then everything I talked about in the first two fetters is super, super easy. No identifying, sorted, done. If that is not you, <laughs> if you're like the rest of us uh, and you have like... Um, topics where emotions come up like fear and guilt and shame then you need to look at it but i just want to take a, a moment to talk about the healthy component of it so the healthy fear is about keeping us safe it's about not going into a white unmarked van it's about having that um, gut feeling when somebody says yeah that's great you should do that and you just can feel a body no i <laughs> most definitely should not um, that that um, very, very clear body yes, body no, we're talking more about that in the ninth phase, but I would like to start to introduce, I have talked about it a bit, and I'm introducing you more to it now, when we talk about the healthy um, fear and giggle and shame, because the healthy fear is when you have a very, very clear body no, I don't want to do that, it doesn't feel safe, it doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do that, and then you don't do it. That's the healthy fear. The healthy anger is about creating strong boundaries. Um, if you look at if you look at a map, you know of the world, you can see all the countries have very very clear boundaries to where it is, and that very very clear boundary makes it so that you are not just you know building a house and another boundary that is not part of yours. The same level of boundary is what you need in you. So when somebody's asking you, oh, could you drive me seven hours uh, <laughs> to pick up a puppy? And you have like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And then they get angry about it. If you can be bullied by anger into, some, into doing something, then your boundaries are being changed. Your, your boundaries is being disrespected, you have said no, it's not being respected, and therefore the boundaries are slowly, slowly moving. Uh, I'm talking more about that in the six. Somebody's asking you, would you drive me seven hours to pick up a puppy? And you go like, no, I really don't want to do that. They get angry. The healthy anger, anger that you then feel is like, hang on, I'm allowed to say no. I'm allowed to say I don't want to drive you. I don't want to drive you. There's no point in you yelling at me. You yelling at me is not making me drive you anywhere. That's the healthy anger. So the healthy anger is not rage. That is unhealthy. The healthy anger is not raising your voice. That is unhealthy. The healthy anger is just being completely and utterly clear that, nope, not doing this. About boundaries, nope, not doing this. That's the healthy anger. The healthy guilt is what is keeping us ethically. So whenever we feel guilty about something, it's when we, we are on a path and we know what is the right thing to do and we don't do that, then we feel, feel guilty. Normally, you know, if you say something that's a lie, then you feel guilty about it. So the healthy guilt is what is keeping you in alignment with, with your values. It keeps you in alignment with, with how you want to be in the world. And that is when you have healthy guilt. So when you get that sensation, ooh, that wasn't nice, ooh, I didn't like that. I, they were talking behind, 
um, Janice back. I didn't like that feeling at all. Then you have that feeling of guilt for not speaking up. That's healthy guilt. That's you realizing that, ooh, that is not in line with me. I do not like when people are talking behind someone else's back. I don't like that. That's not for me. I don't like that. That's healthy guilt. Healthy shame is when you're reminded about that you're human. You're not God. You're not supposed to be perfect. You're not supposed to, to, um, to be in any certain way. You're just human. So that's the healthy shame. That's when we have, um, let's say you stumble down some stairs and you feel shameful when you're landing. If you feel shameful about stumbling down, down some stairs, then there's something about shame you need to look at. Um, it's a great reminder. Healthy shame is a great reminder in so many ways. Having that healthy um, navigation back to, oh, I thought I got a bit, you know, uh, pompous. I got a bit arrogant. I got a bit, you know, just reminding yourself that, hang on, hang on. You are just like everyone else. There's no difference. There's no difference. Why would you be unique? Why would you be something special? To be reminded that you're not. You're just like the rest of us. You know, that's the healthy shame. So the healthy fight, flight, freeze, when that is happening, is what is giving us strong boundaries, is what is giving us a clear sense of self, a clear um, ability for self-care. I'm talking about that in the third fetter. Uh, a clear, healthy ability for self-care, um, a very clear self-worth, and a very clear self-love. And I know that there is no self, but we are talking about when we're children, when it's very, very important that we have these senses. We need to have that sen sense of self in order for us to now let go of it and just be with what is. So I made this overview just to make it easy to look at. And you have the feeling out to the left. You can see fear, anger, guilt, and shame is there. You have the healthy response. Fear is when you're choosing healthy relationships and situations. Anger is when you're protecting and creating clear boundaries. Guilt is reminding us that we're in a direction that is not in line with our ethics. And shame is teaching us humility and keeping us grounded. If you haven't had a skillful upbringing and you haven't had, and you let's say you have had dysfunctional parents and you have had a life where, where you weren't, they were not able to feel the healthy fear and guilt and shame in them, then they pr clearly could not give that to you. You can't pour from an empty jug. So if you haven't got healthy boundaries and healthy self-worth and healthy self-love, you cannot teach your children. If you have a conditioned reaction, that is where you have um, an immature interpretation of, any, of an experience, which is exactly that you are overreacting to what is happening um, or you have a toxic starting point. The connection between fear and inadequacy is that you, you sit and you are here and something, you have to do something and you get the feeling of fear as if you are not adequate to do it, as if there's something wrong with you. I am not, I should be. That is when fear really can you know, take root in us. Um, and that inadequacy is, it's just a thought. What you do with it when you say, when, when you feel it is that you are aware this is about fear. The foundation of this is fear. I feel unsafe. I feel that right now I'm moving into a position where it's better if I don't do it. Um, and that is the that is the 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 ego and on one side and you know it's it's selfing both of them are selfing so what you do is that you sit with inadequacy and you breathe into it you just open up to okay i feel super super inadequate can i be in a body where i feel inadequate it is so so uncomfortable stay with it stay with it stay with it you will then very very quickly feel that your mind is jumping up to the fear and going back to the inadequacy. And it's like it's like the, the thought is fueling itself with the fear and going back to inadequacy. And then you start to project doing second error things and you start to project what will happen, what will happen, what, what, how, what you will and all those scenarios. And that is why you don't do it. 
Um, so the, the feeling of inadequacy is a lie. It's a lie. It's uh, identification. And it's not real. Other fear that is in the same category is uh, panic and, and anxiety. It's the same thing. All three starting points can feel fear. So both the, the aggressive bully and the passive aggressive bully and the chameleon, it's mostly the chameleon that feels fear. Um, and it's mostly the chameleon that has that uh, conditioned about fear. Now, we are we are all three. You're all three all the time. And you will probably have, have when you saw the lesson, you probably felt that you were all three at the same time. You know, you recognize yourself in all of them because you are all three at the same time. It's just in different situations, you react differently. Um, and if you're locked into fear, then it's about it's about that making yourself small. Um, listen to the solution for the chameleon, where it's about that making yourself small. It's about you not being in the world, about completely um, complete invisibility, wishing not to be here, wishing to completely vanish. That is the feeling that you have. Um, The way that we normally react when we feel fear. Um, I'm now talking about something that I'm I'm talking more about in the fourth and the fifth, and it's what I call the verbal indicators. And the verbal indicators is words that we use or sentences we create that is pointing to one of the emotional indicators. And a verbal indicator um, that is connected with fear is explaining, that is justifying. So you're justifying yourself because you have a sense of, ina of inadequacy and fear. Uh, you are explaining yourself so nobody can attack you in any way because of inadequacy and fear. But I'm getting back to the fear in a moment. The second feeling is anger. The healthy response is protecting and creating clear boundaries. Um, when it's conditioned or and it's immature and you have an immature reaction to an experience, then you react with rage. You react with annoyance, revenge, um, you punish people. It's in all three, uh, but is particularly the uh, the aggressive bully that is there. I have a full list of all the, <laughs> where I found all the words that I think is uh, where we uh, justify our action, but it's actually anger that is underneath. Yeah, but we're getting back to that in a second. And the ego reaction and the way that we avoid um, insight, it's by blaming, you know, it's by pointing fingers. Um, you are not like you should be. I am. You are not. You should be different. Um, so the blaming is always about an underlying sensation of anger and an immature reaction to a sensation. And... And when you are the aggressive bully, especially, you tend to be in that category where you bully people into submission to get your way. And you do that by blame. You point fingers. You point fingers. Then there's uh, guilt. Guilt is the healthy response is, is reminding us that we are in a direction that is not in line with our ethics. Um, the immature interpretation of an experience is when we are abandoning responsibility or accountability. So we feel guilty about something we have done, something we feel, and um, and instead of being holding ourselves accountable and being with it and moving forward, we are relinquishing responsibility and accountability, which means that we are placing, uh, we're placing it on someone else or something else. We are putting up, we're taking ourselves out of the equation completely. Um, and the, the verbal indicator that is connected with guilt is complaining. So you feel guilty about something, you don't want that feeling, so you complain about something else. And then we can talk about that. The feeling in you about guilt is still there. So the feeling about guilt is still there. But we don't look at that. We look at what you're complaining about, Karen. <laughs> That's where you are. And the personality that is very often tied in with this is the passive aggressive bully, the one that is manipulating situation around them um, by complaining. So you complain about something, people are solving it, and then you just you know complain about something else, and people are solving it, and then you complain about something else because the underlying feeling you have 
is guilt. And you don't want to look at that. The last one is shame. And the healthy response is that shame is teaching us humility and keeping us grounded. Now, the unhealthy response and the immature response is inadequacy and hopelessness. Um, shame is, and, and shame is for all three. Um, all three toxic starting points deal with shame. And shame is a big one. I'm going to talk more about it in a second. And obviously, shaming is the underlying you know, that's the verbal indicator of shame. So I said it before and I would like to repeat it. Whenever you have a feeling of fear, anger, guilt and shame, you are diverting. This is only a distraction. Any feeling you get, it's just a distraction. Whenever you have a feeling that you need to put your foot down, that you need to mark your words, you need to show your boundaries, you need to say no, you need to, well, I'm going to tell them. That is a diversion. It's a diversion. You're doing something to avoid something else. So instead of reacting, get into the, into the feeling that you have of fear, anger, guilt and shame and just stay with that. You cannot have any reaction that is a good reaction. You can respond, which is a good response. So for example, if you have healthy fear, and you respond with, nope, not getting into that van, that is a response. If you have a reaction of anger going like, oh, I'm going to rah, 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 that is a reaction. All reactions are diversions. You're diverting from something else. You're distracting from something else. So whenever you have the feeling that you need to, you know, speak your piece, put your phone down, show them, just remember that that is identification and is only happening in you. Other people don't react like that. And if other people don't react like that, it's not truth. Now, if you then, you know, socialize with people that all react <laughs> like that, then you might be very, very tempted to believe that this is normal. It's not. It's identification. You don't need to. If other people can be in the same situation and not react like you do, then it is identification and you need to look at it. So whenever you have that feeling of, but I need to tell them, I need to tell them, I need to say no. I ask yourself, are you sure? Are you sure you need to do that? Are you sure about that? There are other people in this world that don't react like that. Why do you have the need to do that? So I'm not, obviously, I hope you hear that. I'm not talking about you putting yourself in danger. I'm not talking about you jumping into a white unmarked van or letting, you know, Uncle Peter file babysit. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about you being aware of when you are identifying with fear, anger, guilt and shame and what is underneath that identification. I'm not talking about you walking out in front of traffic. Um, I'm not talking about that. I hope you hear that. I hope you hear that. Okay, let's talk about anger. Healthy anger is an expression of boundaries and is a reference to you about where you are. However... Anger does not influence your mood. If your mood is influenced by anger, you are identifying. You're no longer in healthy anger. You are identifying and something else is going on and that you need to look at. If it influences your mood, you need to look at the diversion. So in order to look into the diversion, then when you feel that anger and you feel how it's changing your mood, look into it. Just stay with it. Stay with the feeling that you're experiencing right now. So you know where you are and you know why you think you need to put your foot down or why you think you need to make your opinion clear to everyone else. In that lies the trauma. So be curious towards that. What is it right now that you feel that you need to be angry about? What is What opinion is lying underneath here? What is it that you think will happen if you don't put your foot down or react angrily. What do you think is there? And you might be in a position now where you some somebody's saying something to you, you have seen through self, somebody's saying something to you and you react with anger and then it's gone. Then you might be tempted to say, well, it's not really there. It's just happening and then it's disappearing. Well, it's happening. It's happening. It just influenced your mood. Anger, healthy anger does not influence your mood. So if it influenced your mood, even though just for a short, short period, 
there's something for you to look at. You need to look into why you think that that reaction was needed. Why was that? Why was that? What did this remind you of? In what part are you unsafe right now? Why do you need to put your foot down? Why do you need to be yelly and loud? Why is that? Look into that. So sit, close your eyes, not now, but when you when it happens, close your eyes and breathe with it. See if you can f- go into the feeling of the anger and separate the feeling from the sensation. See if you can look into what is that. You might experience um, a very, very quick flash of a memory. And it might be, I'm just saying now, it might be like a memory of your dad. This is how my dad, he reacted. Oh my goodness, I have copy pasted my dad. I'm not my dad and I'm doing just like he did. Ah, okay. This is actually an opportunity for you to look at your dad with different eyes. Because you, right now, were your dad. And you might say, I'm not like my dad in any way. Well, congratulations, you are. You just were. Now you know exactly how he felt. You know exactly how he felt in him when anger just arose in him. He felt exactly like you just did. So look into that. Can you have compassion for your dad? Can you look at your dad in different ways? Can you look at at the perpetrator in different ways? If you have copy-pasted a a habit pattern and you are reacting in a certain way, then look into that. All your assumptions and all your judgments that you had against your dad or that person, look into that. You need to you need to update all of them because you just experienced how it is to be that person because you just did exactly the same. Which means that just like you can justify your action in this right in this moment, so could your dad. Except in that incident, it was you that was on the receiving end of it. Put yourself in the position. Breathe with it. Close your eyes and breathe with it. Can you see that you are your dad? That you are ex- acting exactly like him? There's no difference at all. Can you see that the person you just yelled at is just like you? There's no difference at all. Do you see that? Just like you might now say, well, that person really provoked me. Well, what did your dad usually say about you? Did he usually tell you that you were provocative? Did he usually tell you to be quiet, to sit still? And when you didn't, if you laughed too loud or if you did something, then he was on your case. It, how is that not exactly the same? How is that not exactly the same? Breathe, breathe. Whatever reaction you get with anger, it's an old, old habit that you have copy pasted from another person. Feel compassionate towards that person. Feel compassionate towards you and just create space to what is. In the situation, then you go from having the feeling and the emotion of anger into the sensation of just being. How is it to be in your body right now? Can you stay in the gap? Can you go from the ego into the gap where you're just observing? You're observing your body, you're observing the situation, and you hold so much acceptance and compassion and love towards you, the situation, and the other person. Is that possible? Can you do that? Can you do that? So you might, when we talk about anger, you might have that feeling that, but hang on, does that mean that I'm I'm just, you know, people can just do with me whatever they want to do? Am I not ever supposed to say no? Am I not ever supposed to? Of course you are. Of course you are. I just told you, That healthy anger is about boundaries. But you can say no. You can have that sense, that feeling of healthy anger arising. That can happen without you raising your voice, without you changing your mood. That can happen. This is about you saying no. Just like you can say yes, or you can say shoe, or you can say car, or you can say Saturday. It's just the same thing. It's just a word. You can say no without raising your voice. You can say no without intimidating or frightening or being, you know, blowing yourself up. You can just say no. That's it. And then it's said. And that's it. There's nothing more to it. And when you're in the gap, when you're in the middle between the ego and the the authentic and you're in the middle, it doesn't really matter. You saying no is just you saying no. That's it. 
no, I don't want to do that. Done. There's nothing more to it. There's no opinion about it. There's no right or wrong about it. It's just a no. And that's it. So I've made you this list um, to look at. <laughs> and you can just pick randomly from this list whatever feeling you feel, whatever emotion you have, whatever you call it, it's not relevant. It's nothing but an opinion. It's not true. It's not relevant. It's not important. And you don't have to express it. It's only there for you to look into. So whatever of these feelings that you have, whatever comes up, it's always a secondary emotion that has an underlying reason hidden away under it. Um, and those everyday diversions that you have with any of those words, annoyance, irritation, um, any of those, it's just a diversion. It's just a diversion. There's something underneath, something boiling underneath that you're not looking at. And then you get that allowed feeling or allowed emotion that you are then diverting with so you don't get in contact with it. There's always something underneath. And very often underneath uh, anger, there's sadness, a lot of sadness. You have tears in your ears. You don't really, really hear what it's saying. You're putting yourself in a position where you're not very old. You're not very old. And, and the sadness that you have is, is being repressed and you're adding anger on top because it's more allowed to be angry and to fight. You might have grown up in a family where anger was more accepted than sadness and tears. Um, if that is the case, I think you know what to do. So let's say now that from now on, you are skillful and wise in all your actions, in all your thoughts, in all your interactions with other people. How will things look? How would it look if you were skillful and wise in all your interactions? How would um, this be a thing? Um, or how would I respond? This what is just happening right now. If I was wise and skillful, how would I respond? How could my decision be different if I reflected on what was happening and I was skillful and wise in it? How would I change my decision? Or would it change if I was wise and skillful? How would all my childhood trauma be experienced completely different if I looked at my entire past wise and skillfully? What would change? How would it be different? If I no longer blamed, complained, shamed and explained and I didn't have any fear and guilt and shame, how would my entire past change? How could I look at that skillfully with full lots of compassion and acceptance and love and, and understanding for everybody involved? How would that look differently? How would I manage this conflict I'm in right now if I was skillful and wise? Ask yourself that. Let's say I was skillful and wise. How would I manage this conflict right now? How much of the disappointment, the suffering I have in my life is self-created only because I refuse to be skillful and wise about it. So this anger burst explosion that I have right now, what would happen with that if I was skillful and wise? Would it still be here? What happens to a thought when I don't think it? What happens to a feeling of anger if I don't feel it? What happens to an emotion of anger if I don't attach any thought to it? And again, I'm not talking about you not sensing your boundaries. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that delusion that, that you are in, that you think that you need to react with anger in order to protect yourself. You don't. There are lots of people in the world that don't, which means you don't either. You've just been taught that you did. And again, I would like for you to look at your childhood. If no one did anything wrong, if no one could have done anything better, if everything that was done to you was done exactly like it was supposed to, then having an opinion that they should have done differently is just an opinion. Do you see that? So look at that identification that is attached with that opinion. And look at your overall theme in your childhood. If it was about anger, how has that, with the ripple effect, affected your life today? 
How are you maintaining that anger in your life today? And what would happen if you were skillful about it? Where would it go? I would like to talk about fear. Just like anger. Fear is not on the top 10 of feelings we want to have. It's one of those that we really, really don't want to have. But just like healthy anger is keeping you safe, so is is healthy fear. And healthy fear, it keeps you in healthy relationships. It keeps you with healthy experiences. It keeps you having healthy thoughts, healthy actions. And all of them are in line with that being, you know, with that sense of just being, where nothing needs to change and nothing needs to happen. When you feel fear, then breathe and feel into the fear. Feel into that motivation that the fear is having on you. Because fear is a very motivating factor, just like anger is a very, very motivating factor. How is fear manipulating you into making decisions in your life that you wouldn't make otherwise? That's the unhealthy fear. The healthy fear is giving you a very, very clear sensation of of what is protecting the existence And what is not? The unhealthy fear is like completely missing the point. (laughs) It's telling you that everything is unhealthy. Everything is dangerous. Everything is is fear evoking. Everything can kill you. And you're right. Everything can kill you. You're absolutely right. How is that skillful right now to look at it like that? And I'm not talking about jumping out of a plane without a parachute. Not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you have agoraphobia and you don't want to leave your house, that fear is keeping you from, from, from the being. It's keeping you away from where you um, actually are able to live your life. So when you feel fear, just breathe into it and feel into that motivation of the fear and just keep observing what is happening. Where are you right now? In your direct experience right now, when you sit with fear, do you see that the feeling of fear is a thought? The sensation of fear is something completely different. If you stay with the sensation that you have in your body right now, do you see that the sensation is not connected with the thought? The sensation of fear is not the feeling of fear. Do you see that? And then ask yourself, is there really a reason to react? Is there a reason to react? Can you stay with that feeling of fear? Can you create space for that feeling of fear? Because normally when we have fear, when we have an anxiety or panic attacks, there's something underneath. There's something that we're not looking at. We have put a lid on something. And that something needs space. But in order for you to get down to it, to get in contact with it, You need to stay with the fear. Can you stay with the fear? Can you stay here right now and just breathe? And what is indicating that you need to react? So when you're caught in fear, the third feta and the ninth feta is going to be super, super challenging for you. Because it's where you, you think that you can plan into the future and make life more safe. You can't. You think that you can prepare in advance and you can't it makes you very very fearful so just stay with that what right now needs your planning right in this moment absolutely nothing it's a diversion it's a diversion there's something that while you are fearful in planning and preparing and making sure everything in the future is going to be in a certain way while that is happening something else is not happening And what is it that is not happening? Normally it's life. Normally the pure being of you actually feeling what is happening, sensing with your body what is happening, that is what you're diverting from. And you can divert from that with a full lifetime. With a full lifetime. So that making sure that everything, that that the future is safe, well then I am prepared. That's fear. That's fear. 
And it's delusional. Absolute delusional. When you get in contact with fear, can you feel that there's like an undercurrent of fear in your life all the time? Can you become aware of that? And can you see that you're trying to protect yourself? Do you see that? So make contact with your body. And notice how your thoughts are in the future. You just projected that the future is unsafe. But how do you know that? How do you know the future is unsafe? Stay with it. Just stay with it. What thoughts are coming up? Do you see that it's another thought, another thought, another thought? That you keep adding on to it? Like the error I talked about? Like the ego, I am not, I should be? Do you see that? Do you see that it's just thought too? You're in the future, you're not here right now. You think that you can manipulate the future into being in a certain way by making sure that everything now is going to be all right in the future. Do you see that's impossible? Do you see that? And of all the identification that you could have picked from, you picked that exact one where you feel unsafe. So I can recommend you to go back to the first feta and watch the lesson four and five that is about ego death, because this is about death. This is about protecting your life versus losing your life. Lo protecting your safety versus losing your safety. And is that ever possible? Is that ever possible? Are you sure that you can lose your life? That you can lose your safety? Are you sure about that? So can you be in a body that is decaying? Can you be in a body where safety can you be in a body that feels unsafe can you be in a world that is unsafe you might have no <laughs> i really can't that's why i have fear and just stay with that can you accept that you can't be in your body because of fear can you create space for that and then also look into all the things that makes you feel safe and look into the delusion of them because that's a delusion too. All the things you create a fearful story about is a delusion. All the things you create a story about that if you just do that, then you're safe. That is a delusion too. You're locked into mind. There's no presence and no being in where you're at right now. And the thing about fear is that it's like, it's like pearls on a string, you know? It one follows the other like that. It's like that. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then. And that is completely impossible to stop when you're in it. Just like if I if I say da 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 da. Completely impossible not to stop, <laughs> not to finish the song. Same thing, same thing. When you're in fear and you're caught in fear, you are in the future. So what you need to do is that whenever you have a, a feeling of fear, you just allow it to be there. Can you be in a body that is fearful? Breathe. Can you see that right now you are in the future? You're not here. What you think that you need to do in the future for you to be safe is a projection of you feeling unsafe now. How can you stay with you right now? And breathe. Do you feel your bum? Do you feel your feet on the ground? Do you feel your breath? Start to meditate where you pay attention to your direct experience of what you feel and what you sense in your body right now. And then you split them. You notice that the feeling is always a thought. The sensation is just a pure being. And then you stay with that. And just stay with that. I would like to talk about guilt. And guilt is what reminds us that we are in a direction that does not meet our personal code of conduct. It's whenever you're doing something that is not in alignment with your values. If you have very clear values about something and you're doing the opposite, then you feel guilty for doing it. So that is lying, for example. You might feel guilty for lying. You might then... Um, 
minimize the experience by saying, but it was, it was a white lie. It was to protect them. No, it wasn't. Stay with that feeling of guilt because you know that a lie is a lie. You're never protecting anyone but yourself. So stay with that feeling of guilt. So whenever you feel guilt about something, it's because you are away from your values. You have left that. You know what your values are and you have left that. It's a very, very good indication for you to get back to your values. A lot of people feel guilt for being sick and then they feel guilty for calling into work and saying they're sick so the other colleagues, they have extra work. So therefore they prefer to go to work when they are sick. And then they feel guilty about going to work because they're sick and then now they will affect the entire office. If we take that scenario, what I'm saying is that you're not feeling guilty about calling in sick. You're feeling guilty about the life that you have arranged around you that scrapes you so thin that you can't even be sick. The life that you have created about around yourself is not in alignment with the life that you would prefer. It's not in alignment with the life that you um, feel is where you could relax the most. Whenever we have the feeling of guilt, it's because we know that there's something else that is better and we haven't done that. We haven't chosen that. And I know that when I say that, and, and I, I'm sitting and talking about your life, I know it's a big one. Because if you have that general spread out guilt <laughs> about everything, guilt about your children, guilt about your husband, guilt about not doing the windows, guilt about um, not going to work and being there more, guilt about your mother-in-law, guilt about your family, guilt about everything. If that is you, then I ask you to breathe. Just breathe. You've got too much on your plate. You've got way too much on your plate. You know that 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 the values that you ha have in your life, it's more about just half-assing it. You know, and right now you're living a life where you're half-assing it. That's why you're guilty about everything. You know that your values are different. You know that you will like full awareness with your children, with your partner, with your family, with your co-workers. But because you're trying to um, not look into the underlying feeling, which is usually about worth. And I just want to say worth is shame. Then we create a life around us where we can't keep up. We can't keep up. And there's so many things that we should do, that we think we should do, and we don't. And we can't keep up. And that makes us guilty all the time. It's tied into shame. Guilt, in this case, is just a diversion. It's just a diversion. So when you look back, in other instances where we, we feel guilt, um, then you can look back at, at whatever you did that you feel guilty about. And then you place responsibility. You need to be in that fault-free area with full accountability. Take full responsibility. But you place no blame and you place no guilt and you place no shame. You just look at what happened. So you need to create space and compassion and really, really look at what happened with full respect to the experience you had in order for you to get in contact with the emotion and acknowledge that effect that it had on your life. And you have to do that without placing any fault, any blame, complain, guilt or shame. So there are like two types of guilt. Either you have the guilt that is going to give you a bad conscience. And for example, if you look at at your past, if it's something about your parents, you will defend your parents. You will say that, well, it, 
it was me, you know. Or the other type is where you will use the placement of guilt and blame to give other people responsibility for how you feel today. And that is a diversion. That is a diversion. And then I would like to talk about shame. Shame is a big one. And a lot of the other ones have an underlying current of shame. So just to make it clear, the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt reminds us that we are in a direction that is not in, in line with our values. And shame teaches us humility and reminds us that, that you're human and you're flawed. So just to make a story that is like quick to see the difference. If you lie, you feel guilty. Because you know you're not in that um, direction that you would like to be in. So when you lie and you feel guilty, that's guilt. But if someone catch you in a lie, it's very often that we feel shame. So in the situation, you can ask yourself, do I feel bad because I'm not fulfilling my own values? Or do I feel bad because someone else see that I'm not fulfilling my own values? So shame is whenever we feel that we are not worthy that's the unhealthy shame we're not worthy we're not we don't have any self-worth in us uh, we feel less lesser than there's a very very easy way for you to feel if the shame that you feel is yours or if it's conditioned and if you have a feeling of shame and it's very intense but it's not overwhelming. You can be with a feeling of shame. You can be in the situation that you're in and you can say, okay, that is actually, that is, you know, it's a good reminder. I was a bit arrogant. Yeah, I, I, I see that. And then it's not, it's intense. You feel embarrassed, but you know, you, you can you can be with it. It's, it's fine, it's fine. Then it's yours. If you have a feeling of shame and the feeling is overwhelming, it's out of proportion with what just happened. So some you did you fell down some stairs, you feel so embarrassed, you feel so shameful, you feel like the worst thing. That's out of proportion. That's out of proportion. If a feeling of shame is out of proportion, it's not yours. It's conditioned. And you need to go back into that space where you stay with a feeling of shame. You need to look at what happened at any point in your life where you had this feeling and you were not met, where well, you did not create the space that you actually need. Because right now you are, um, I usually use the example of, you know, of a child, you know, picking the nose, right? There's nothing wrong in picking your nose. In our society, we have a culture where we don't. So when a child is picking its nose and you see a child picking its nose, you just take it aside and go like, I hate when I got stuff in my nose like that. I completely know that, but you know, we don't do that, you know. In public we go into the bathroom and then we sort out our nose and then we go back out again and the kid will go okay and that's it but if you shame the child about picking its nose or whatever else the child is doing the the feeling that the child is getting is out of proportion and that is what we take with us into the adulthood where we're trying for everybody to see us as perfect if you're the type that wants to be perfect in everything that wants everything to look amazing on the outside and you're going for people um, seeing you in a certain way and thinking of you in a certain way. I hope you can hear it's ego. Um, and whenever they discover that that is not you, that it is Botox, <laughs> that it is, you know, lies, that it is just play pretend, then you get so, so shameful. You get so, so embarrassed. You can hardly be in your body. That's not yours. That's not yours. It's conditioned. It's not yours. And I think it's really important to be able to distinguish. You're treating both of them the same way. In that sense, it doesn't really matter. In the direct experience, it doesn't really matter. What you do with it, no matter if you're feeling fear, anger, guilt and shame, what you do with it is that you, you sit with it. You sit with it. You stay with it. First of all, you detect yourself. Um, and then you stay with it. So when you have that feeling of profound shame, 
in what is happening. You just stay with it. You breathe, go into your body, and then start to notice what is the feeling and what is the sensation. Because those two are not the same. The feeling of shame is not real. It's not real. It's, it's completely delusional. There is no feeling of shame. It doesn't exist. You just made it up. It doesn't exist. So you go into the into the body and then you separate the two. So you have the feeling of shame on one side and you have the sensation in the body on the other. And stay with that sensation. How does it feel in your body to be right now with that sensation? Not with the thought attached to it, but just with that sensation. And then you just stay with that. Create space there. And that is where you're, where you're expanding in. The last type of shame I just want to talk about, it's the, it's the worst type of shame. It's the shame when, that you experience on another person's behalf. So let's say you were bullied. If you were bullied in school, then you felt shame by being bullied, by everybody else seeing you being bullied. That is one type of shame. That's the one I talked about until now. The other type of shame is the one the bully experiences. Because by bullying, you are experiencing shame as well. You know this is not, you know, correct ethical behavior. Um, there's probably a lot of both fear, anger, guilt and shame if you were bullied in you. In, and it's diversion. You're diverting from the underlying feeling that you have. The worst kind of shame is the spectator shame. It's the indifferent shame. It's where you are the one that is watching a bully bullying someone else and you're not doing anything. You're watching, you're observing, and you're not doing anything. That's the worst kind of shame. So if you are in a life where you are indifferent to other people's suffering, you are indifferent to what is happening on the planet, you are indifferent to all the different things, a lot of that, the reason why you can stay indifferent is because you are avoiding that underlying shame that you have. When you get in contact with that, that's a lot. It's going to be a lot because everything needs to be different. We're talking about you being reminded that you are human, that you have a, you have accountability, you have a responsibility. And becoming aware of that, if you put a lid on it, it's a lot. It's a lot. So just just stay with that. Okay, that was fear, anger, guilt and shame. What I would like for you to do and how you move forward with this is meeting the pain. Just stay with it. When you're in a situation where you have, where you experience the feeling or the emotion of fear, anger, guilt and shame, you just stay with it. You breathe into it. You can withdraw yourself from the situation if you need. And then you close your eyes, you breathe into it, and then you separate the two. Because they're not connected. Fear, anger, guilt and shame is delusional. There is no such thing as fear, anger, guilt and shame. It's thought that is happening. It's identification with thoughts that is happening. Identification with feelings that is happening. But you need to meet the pain. If you just bypass it all and say it doesn't matter, it's not real. Penilla says it's not real. That's bypassing gaslighting. I don't want you to do that. I want you to meet and experience the pain. So what you do is you, you close your eyes, you breathe, you put yourself in contact with the body, and then you separate the two. How much of this is thought? How much is this fear, anger, guilt, and shame is thought? How does this sensation feel in the body? And you will feel that there is a split between the two. One thing is thought, Another thing is sensation. Two completely different things. If you can't separate it, if it's like completely interwoven and you can't separate it, then you ask yourself, can I be in a body that is full of fear, anger, guilt or shame? Can I be in a body where, where, where it's possible for me to experience that, to feel that, so you meet the pain? It's either yes or no. Either yes, I can be in the body with fear, anger, guilt and shame. Great, do that. You will at some point be able to separate. And then you will have the fear, anger, guilt and shame here. It feels like something outside, away. It's just a thought. 
and you will have a sensation in your body that's completely different. Or you won't be able to, to uh, be in a body with fear, anger, guilt and shame. Then you need to accept that you can't be in a body full of fear, anger, guilt and shame. That's one thing you can do. On a daily basis, I would like for you to close your eyes and breathe. Just be with whatever is right now. It's what I call just sitting or what is called just sitting, where you just sit. It could be two minutes, five minutes, half an hour, 10 hours. It's up to you. What you do is you just sit and you are just present with what is right now, not your thoughts. Your thoughts are separate, just like sense of smell, sense of hearing, sense of seeing, touching, tasting. All that is separate. But just being with your direct experience right now and you just sit. That's the second thing I would like for you to do. The last thing I would like for you to do is move your body because the body remembers everything. In your body, you have fear, anger, guilt and shame and that can be activated. So you, if you start to move, like put music on that you like, start to move with it, you might feel ridiculous, amazing, that's a feeling. Get in contact with it, do that. Um, you might uh, start to feel pain somewhere, you might start to sob, you might start to... Whatever is coming up by moving your body, and it's by going for walks, doing qigong, tai chi, swimming, running, uh, roller skating, bicycling, or dancing, shaking your body, um, getting in contact with your body and waking up your body in all the different ways because you have fear, anger, guilt, and shame locked into your body. And the more you are in contact with the body, the more you are enjoying your body and using the body, the more you're getting in contact with it. So that was it. That was it. I hope you have gotten an insight into asking the question, who is telling you that you need to be different? Who are they talking to? Who is that who? And who are they talking to? And what message is given? Yeah. Thank you.